I heard some kind of voice. And the words I heard were disseminate spiritual wisdom. How am I gonna do that? How am I gonna do it? He looked at me and he said, Tammy, you know what you wanna do. I mean, disseminate spiritual wisdom, when I started Sounds True and people said, what are you doing? Those were like my magic words because they were given to me. So that was my code word. It's like, that's what we're doing. We're disseminating spiritual wisdom. So my parents had a, a summer home in, okay. uh, in the Berkshires. In the Berkshires, yeah. So they picked me up from an airport and we went to, to their summer home for a bit. And then they said, please get your degree. Just go talk to the head of the religion department, have a conversation. And a gentleman named Don Swearer, and he knew Gunapala Dharmasiri, he knew me, he knew Dharmasiri and his whole family went down to Miami with me, with he, which he thought was crazy for a professor that he had invited to be traveling down with a student to me. Like he just thought the whole thing was crazy. And that, you know, we all went to Disney World together. He was just like on the way to Miami, he was just like, this is crazy. Okay, so I went and talked to him and I said, my parents really want me to have this conversation with you. Is there any way I could, in a meaningful way, finish my degree in the religious studies department? And he said, well, what are you interested in? And I was like, well, I'd like to go live with religious cults and write about my experience of living with different cults and tell you what I learned and experience. And he said, you don't belong at Swarthmore, Tammy. And <laughs> I said, I could have told you that. <laughs> You're right. I don't belong at Swarthmore. You're right. And that was that, that was the end of that conversation. So then uh, it, it's kind of a long story, but my parents were so determined that I graduate from a college that I came out to Boulder, Colorado, where there's a university called Naropa University, which is the first Buddhist university. And I thought I can study this, the intersection between psychology and meditation, and maybe I can get some insight into what happened to me during this journey in Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and the meditation experience, maybe I can get some insight. Mm -hmm. And so I signed up uh, to go to Naropa. But when I went into Naropa, even this groovy university where people meditate, uh, you know, as part of their coursework, I just realized I just didn't want to be in college. It's just something in me that wanted to be free. I just didn't want to do it. And so when I left Naropa, my parents said, we're not going to support you. We're not going to give you any more money. And I was like, you shouldn't give me any more money. Good for you. Stop supporting me. And that's when I started waitressing at the relatively greasy Chinese restaurant with the cook who used to smoke cigarettes over the walk while he was cooking. And whenever the ashes would fall in, he'd just kind of <laughs> mix it in. And he thought it was like part of his special sauce. And then he'd have some beer put a little beer in and people were crazy about his sauces. And I thought uh -huh. they don't know the real re So anyway, I started uh, waitressing at Mr. Lee's Chinese restaurant. And, you know, I told you I was a really competitive person because one of the things I realized even then when I started waitressing, even after all that meditation was the waitresses were like, let's all pool our tips. Uh -huh. And I was like, I'm not pulling my tips with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm like covering half the restaurant at twice the speed Right. With twice the tips. People like, like I, I know how to, I'm not. No, you guys are all like slow, slow boats. So I thought, huh, that's interesting about you, Tammy. I mean, I was reflective even at the time. That's just like interesting that, that that's your spirit. Mm. And is this that around the time that you had developed this 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 prayer that you started yeah. reciting? Yeah. So here I am. I'm, I'm working at uh, the Chinese restaurant and another really big development had happened which is I volunteered at the local community radio station, KGNU, Why? Boulder County Community Radio. Uh, two reasons. When I was at Swarthmore, I had gotten involved uh, with late night radio. They called it the graveyard shift. And the okay. graveyard shift was between midnight and 6 a.m. And the station manager at the college radio station said, here's a key, do whatever you want between midnight and 6 a.m. No one else wants to be up at that hour. So you remember, I'm you know having strange uh, outlier patterns at college. And so the idea that I could go uh, at midnight, open up the radio station, play whatever songs I wanted and talk to people and say, you know, I have a quiz. I want to find out how many people feel uncomfortable wearing shorts. Call me, let me know. I mean, whatever, you know, whatever I could think of. And so I knew I discovered from that that I loved radio. I just loved it. And, you know, I'd been involved uh, with a high school newspaper, so I knew I liked journalism, but I liked audio journalism the most. I just mm -hmm. loved it. 
So that was part of it. Uh, and then secondly, I thought, huh, if I go and I volunteer at the radio station, maybe I could have an interview show where I interview spiritual teachers. And if I'm interviewing spiritual teachers, then I can continue the education that I want and need, but I can't get in an academic setting. And mm -hmm. so I had uh, two shows at the community radio station. One was called the After Hours Audio Amazon, in which I had my music show. Uh, and then I had uh, a sh an interview show called Live from Planet Earth, where I interviewed spiritual teachers. So I'm waitressing, I'm doing this volunteer radio thing, and I'm, you know, just trying to gr kind of grow and integrate as a person. So I'm going to yoga classes. And at one point I decided to do a series of rebirthing sessions. And I don't know if you know much about, this was something that was big in the eighties, but you do this deep breathing. And as part of this rebirthing process, these 10 sessions, you're, you're given the opportunity to say what your prayer is for your life. And mm -hmm. as a result of those rebirthing sessions, the prayer that came to me was, God, I'm willing to do your work. Please show me what it is. Because I knew it wasn't working at this Chinese restaurant and the volunteer radio thing, I didn't, we didn't really have a sense of that being anything but a, a way to share music and get educated myself. So God, I'm willing to do your work. Please show me what it is. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out. And back to the show. Was anybody listening to this radio show? These radio shows? Oh, yeah, yeah, were... yeah. I mean, I had, you know, I don't know how many people were listening to the <laughs> like, audio Amazon because that was between midnight and 3 a.m. But, you know, here in Boulder County, late night radio has a small audience. And then the interview show was on Sundays in the morning at 11 a.m. And we had decent listenership. And I knew there was decent listenership because I would get calls after the show. Okay. And people would say, great, great conversation. Can I get a copy of that? And I was like, oh, interesting. So I, you know, I got a little dubbing deck, you know, one to one copy, press the button. And uh, I would make maybe three to five copies a week on a really good week, seven copies. I'd sell them for 10 bucks. And I would just respond to people who called me and say, can I get a copy of that? Can I get a copy of that? Interesting. And Did I'd you have to split the, the proceeds with the radio no. station or? No, the radio station, like radio station didn't care. I mean, it's a volunteer thing. They were like, good on you. <laughs> okay so then you quit the waitressing job quit the waitressing led... job right well this was a big moment so i quit the waitressing job because uh honestly i just it just was meaningless since you know a certain point and after doing it for about nine months and i had accumulated a little bit of cash not much and i thought i'm going to do this experiment i'm going to say this prayer god i'm willing to do your work i'm just going to say it again and again and again and I'm going to see if meaningful work shows up for me. And then I have an entry in my journal that says, uh, I'm running out of money. Looks like my experiment has failed. Mm -hmm. Period. And the next day I get a call, um, dramatic call that my father has died and, uh, he, he died of heart failure and uh, soon I learn that I'll be uh, receiving a small inheritance and my small inheritance is about 50 grand. And, you know, that was back in uh, 1985. So that would be mm -hmm. like $200,000 today. Mm -hmm. So to a, a 21 year old person, it didn't seem that small to me. It seemed like a lot mm -hmm. of money actually. And then a sequence of events unfolded. Do you want to know what that sequence I was? I would love to know. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm hanging on to every word over here. <laughs> okay. So I get this small inheritance and the question is, what am I going to do with it? And one of the people that I was interviewing for uh, live from planet earth was a local entrepreneur who was into crystals. So it was pretty weird when I would walk to the radio station from the house I lived in, I would walk by his street front 
window that had these large crystals that I'm talking like two, three feet tall, like major mm -hmm. crystals here in Boulder, mm -hmm. Colorado. And I was like, what's that guy doing with those crystals? Like, what's going on? Like, uh, and then he also had a sign in his window, which was a yin yang sign with a dollar symbol through the center of it. And the words transformational economy. So I was also, what's the yin yang sign and the dollar sign doing together? What's going on with this guy? So I'm talking to him, befriending him, trying to learn about crystals. I say to him, I wanna do a radio show with you about crystals. And then I share, hey, you've got this transformational economy sign. I just inherited this money. I'm not sure what to do with the money. I don't really want to put it in the bank. You know, I think the bank uh, could invest in things that wouldn't necessarily reflect my values. So I'm not sure what to do with this money. What should I do with it? And he looks at me and he says, why don't you put the money into yourself? Mm. And I said, well, that's a really good idea, except I don't know what I don't know what to do. Like my, me and myself, we're all confused. We don't know what to do. We're, we're walking the streets, looking in people's windows and stuff. I don't know what to do. And he looked at me and he said, Tammy, you know what you want to do. You know, come back in three days and we'll talk about it. And then I walked out of his office and something really odd happened, something quite odd. The first odd thing that happened was I felt like I wasn't quite walking on the ground after I exited his office. As I was walking on the sidewalk, I felt like I was three feet above the actual pavement. So that was a weird feeling. I was like, I feel like I'm walking in the air. This is really freaking weird. This is a really weird feeling. And then the next thing that happened was that I heard some kind of voice. And I don't know what it was, internal voice, external voice. I have no idea. And the words I heard were disseminate spiritual wisdom period and my foot hit the ground and i started walking on the ground so now i'm walking on the ground and i start thinking about it disseminate spiritual wisdom how am i going to do that how am i going to do it well you know books are a great way i love books but you know there's a lot of people publishing a lot of books i don't know if that would be something i could just break into and then I was like, well, there's video, but my parents watched a lot of television. So they were watching television instead of having the kind of conversations I wanted to have. I don't think I want to go into video and that's an expensive medium. And then it was like audio. Oh my, well, look, I love the radio. I love learning by listening. I already have like one of the smallest cottage businesses in the world with my little dubbing deck, making a couple cassette copies a week. I'll disseminate spiritual wisdom through audio. And that was really the beginning of Sounds True. Did you talk to anyone about that experience the night it happened or, or in the days after it happened? You know, right away, I didn't talk to anybody. I came back and talked to this uh, gentleman with the crystals. I w came back and talked to him about it and mm -hmm. told him what happened. And he said, you know, that building over there, I own it. And the upstairs isn't rented. You could have one of the rooms upstairs for just a couple hundred bucks a month. And I was like, you know, good, um, we're going. So I talked to him and then I kept talking to him and he said, stop talking to me so much. I got to go back to work. I got a lot going on. And I was like, okay, he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. I got to find some other people to talk to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it, so, uh, yeah. I mean, disseminate spiritual wisdom. When I started Sounds True and people said, what are you doing? Those were like my magic words because they were given to me. So that was my code word. It's like, uh, that's what we're doing. We're disseminating spiritual wisdom. Right. And, uh, and so I believe your first recording was Ramdas. Was that the, was that the yeah, first one? It wasn't one? exactly the first one, but you know, I, and at first it was just, I bought a little TCD 5M cassette recorder, you know, so uh -huh. I thought it was such a, a big purchase, you know, whatever, $500 for this. And I would go around and I would record anybody that I thought was giving a lecture or workshop in Boulder that had meaning and value. And I just came, I was like, hi, can I record you? Great. You know, people are like, what? So, and then that built up to having the opportunity to record um, some more uh, celebrity level teachers, if you will, like Ram Dass and Stephen Levine and Marianne Woodman and Clarissa Pinkola Estes and uh, other great teachers uh, in the late 1980s. What was the plan? Um, I'm going to record them and then I'm going to pitch 
a deal with that teacher to no, sell well, so the recordings? The, so the plan was really simple. One of the things I'd seen, and I'd seen it at some, I don't know, like at an event that I'd gone to, was these high-speed cassette duplicating machines. Okay. So you could take a master, and then there was a unit that had three little open slots, and then another unit that had four open slots, and you could string them together. And depending on how many units you had, you could make 10, 13 copies of a cassette master in three minutes. So mm -hmm. I would bring this high speed duplicating equipment with me. I think the part that I feel the most proud of is that I carried these high speed duplicating machines. They were heavy, but I was just like, pick them up, girl. You don't got anyone else who's gonna pick them up. Just pick them up and bring them, you know? So I would take them with me and I would made an arrangement with the presenters where I'd say, hey, Light, you're giving a workshop. Here's the deal. If you're interested in it, I'm going to give you a, a submaster of this recording. You're going to get your own set of master recordings. You can do whatever you want with them. I'm going to professionally record you and you can do whatever you want. What I want to do is make copies for people. And after I cover my costs of being here and you know my equipment costs, whatever, I'll give you a split of the revenue of what happens right here. And this will be a great service to the people who have come who want to leave with, a, they're, they're going to be able to walk out of the workshop on Sunday with copies of what just happened right here. So that was my original pitch to mm -hmm. the teachers. And a lot of the teachers were, were amenable. They're like, oh, good, I got a, you know, and a lot of them said, you can't sell it later. And I was like, that's fine. You no, know, some people didn't care. And then uh, what happened was I accumulated a whole wall of cassette masters that I had beautifully labeled from all of the events that I went to. And uh -huh. a few years later, I was talking to someone who was a direct mail catalog expert. And he, he came, we were talking because I saw that every time I went to a new place, people were interested in what I had recorded previously. Right. And that those authors who had given me permission to continue to sell those presentations, I had a list and at the time it was just a pink sheet of paper that had a list on both sides of it that I Xeroxed, that I gave away everywhere I went. And I'd get mail orders. People would take the pink sheet with them and then they would send in, I'd like a copy of this, a copy of that, a copy of that. I was like, oh God, you know? So I thought, huh, maybe I should make a catalog, like something that's better than this pink sheet of paper. So a friend of a friend of mine was a direct mail catalog expert. He came in, he looked at the wall of cassette masters and he said, you know, you're sitting on a gold mine, Tammy. And I said, you think it's a gold mine? It's a bunch of unedited workshop recordings. <laughs> and you were a one woman and show at this point, right? Totally, like you're schlepping totally. around with this stuff. Totally. Was it only in Boulder? Were you traveling to LA and all these other places? You know, I started traveling a little bit and hiring a couple people, but it was still mostly me, you know? And then okay. when we would go places, we would stay up all night, uh, you know, making cassette copies. So we'd have enough of them ready, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the next day when people were to leave. So we'd have just the final session that we had to record, but everything else would be, you know, it was, it was crazy work. Right? You know, it was, was work for crazy people, but, but it was anyway. paying for itself. It was, you're, you're yeah. making a decent oh, yeah. living. Well, I don't know. Decent. Uh, I thought it was good. I, I mean, these are events. You were I were 25. Wanted to, yeah. Yeah. These were events I would have paid to go to anyway, if I had the money right. to pay to go right. to them. So I was like, I'm getting into the event for free. So first of all, that was a win, big win. Second big win, I'm sitting at the back of the room with a pair of headphones on, so I don't have to really participate in all the exercises and stuff, which made me nervous. <laughs> so that was the second big win. Third big win, I leave afterwards, after I've duplicated all these cassettes, with cash in my pocket. Because people, were, people would pay cash for these cassette uh -huh. recordings. I was like, that's pretty cool. And uh, fourth big win, I got to meet and interact with these spiritual teachers that I right. revered and give them a, a copy and all of that. And also, you know, I mentioned to you what happened to me when I was meditating. I was also that I went so far out that I couldn't integrate and come back in. And all right. this hard work and schlepping and staying up all night and labeling cassettes ad nauseum, you know, till my thumbs hurt. All of that was so embodying for me. It was just so good for me, so grounding. Huh. And it really helped me take all this energy and uh, find a way to use it and, you know, be engaged and learn at the same time. So anyway, when this gentleman looked at the wall of masters and said that, 
he said, you know, I can build us a catalog. I can make a catalog. That's what I know how to do. I can make a little cover for each one of these programs, each one of these workshops you've recorded, and we'll put it in a catalog. And I was like, well, look, if you're going to package these programs with this phrase that he had, standalone information products, as a standalone information product, if we're going to package each one, I really want to edit them really carefully. And I'd learned how to edit on a big reel-to-reel -reel machine from mm. volunteering at the radio station. And I was like, I want to edit. It's all coming one. together. I love it. I was like, I want to edit each one really carefully because often with these live recordings, there's questions you can't hear. There's announcements about going to the bathroom and people don't want that if they're going to buy something from a catalog. They need a really beautifully edited program. So that was how he and I started our partnership. He ended up earning 20% of the original business through a sweat equity arrangement. I could only afford to pay him $10,000 a year for the first few years. So I paid him that small amount of money and then he earned uh, his part of the ownership and we put out the first Sounds True catalog together. If you like that video, you're gonna love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.